All right, I think Jim is already here as well. Yeah. All right. So, start recording, Pedro? Yes, already All recording. Right. So, here, here we are again. Uh, hi, everyone. So, uh, we are here to uh, discuss a few, a few, I mean, just one topic of uh, the identity, which is wish uh, or the first DID method that we'll embrace. Uh, is very important, and we need we need to come up with um, with a decision on these subjects because um, we will not be able to embrace um, two or three DID methods uh, as the first as the first ones because it will require more work. So we need to make a decision, and it's very important for us to feel safe uh, in terms of the first DID method to adopt. Um, so the first the first thing that we need to to consider is that. We have three um, candidates, um, and I'm, I'm already uh, going to the, the agenda. So this is the first topic on the agenda uh, in terms of the discussion, which, which is um, decide the first ID method. We have IPID, uPort, and Blockstack. So, uh, Andrea, sorry, sorry, quick, quick question. Uh, is there a note taker? Do you want me to take notes or someone else? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, please, if, if anyone can volunteer to take notes, it would be awesome. Anyway, if if you, if anyone, um, if if everyone doesn't you know want to take notes, we can take notes afterwards by rewatching the video. Yeah, I, I can I can attempt to take notes and. All right. So, in terms of the three candidates, IPID um, is a DID method based on IPFS. More specifically, uh, it uses um, IPNS in order to add mutability. So essentially, you have your DID, and your DID, I'm going to write here as an example, your DID will be something like um, DID, IPID, and, your, and your, the hash of your public key of the IPNS entry, or your, your peer. So this is, this is based on IPID uh, specification, which is, um, was created by Johnny Crunch. And it's really simple. Basically, you point, um, use IPNS to point to a different version of the DID document. And the DID document, for people that don't know already, I've, I can have here an example, a short example. So we have a list of public keys. It's not really like that, but imagine something like this. And also, you have an important field called authentication. I think that's the correct property, where you state uh, keys can authentication. For instance, I can say that this one and this one can can or may be used for authentication. So, essentially, this DID method is based on IPFS and IPNS. And whenever you need to need to mutate the document, you create the document, put it on IPFS. You have the CID. And then you say, okay, this IPNS entry now points to the new CID. That's basically it. Um, the issue with this approach, and that's one of the, the points of this. Um, IPNS key gets compromised. We basically get the whole identity recovery because the key is actually part of the DID itself, right? Another the DID will be different itself. So we can't really recover uh, master key, uh, let's, let's call it like that, is compromised. But before that, we need to make a decision on the method uh, to adopt. We also have uports and block stack. Uh, Uport is a project that, that is um, and it uses the Ethereum. Uh, um, Andrea, sorry, you're you're cutting cutting out cutting off. Not the DID document, and I think that the DID document on the my, my internet is lucky. This is uh, a bit a bit laggy. Uh, I think that. All right. Let me. Perhaps uh, Pedro and Pash, could you turn off your. I will, I will turn off my video. Okay, sorry. 
Can can you hear me now, Pedro? Yes, I can. All right. Um, so I turn I turn off my. We also have Uport and Oxtech, made by consensus, an Ethereum blockchain, blockchain. Um, and they basically use the blockchain uh, to issue changes uh, to the DID documents. And I think the DID document is actually stored on IPFS, I'm not sure, but I'm most certain that it is. And on the blockchain, they simply store the pointer um, to the DID document, which is stored on IPFS. And also we have Blockstack, the Bitcoin uh, network uh, as well. And it's also a DID method, method as well. Um, but right, if, if we're gonna uh, Blockstack, we need to understand that IPID uses IPNS and we need the IPNS to uh, be stable and be reliable and be performant. Um, and by talking to a few people on the lip 2 p and also the APFS projects, some concerns were raised in terms of those topics like performance and st stability. So uh, to invite Flashco to this discussion, uh, he's contributing to the lip 2 p um, uh, on the JavaScript side. So, if, if possible, Vlasko, could you uh, give your feedback and potential solutions to, to the performance and reliability issues that um, IPID, um, IPNS has at the moment? Yeah, okay. Can you all hear me well? Yes. Okay, so a small update in the current state of IPNS. Uh, in the next release of JSIPFS, there is the 0.35. We'll hopefully have the DHT enabled by default and also interoperable with GoIPFS, which essentially is necessary for you to use IPNS. Uh, however, uh, IPNS is still not performant, and uh, the biggest uh, bottleneck is, uh, uh, as we uh, identified in the LIP2P team week, is the DHT performance, both in Go and in JS. Uh, but we currently do not have uh, benchmarks about uh, how much time we take, and that's one of the things that we will hopefully do in the near future. However, uh, now the most efficient way of using IPNS in JavaScript and uh, also in Go is enabling the IPNS over PubSub uh, and uh, using only the DHT for persistence, which uh, may be a way for you to start if you want to use IPNS. Uh, and uh, uh, in uh, uh, our plans for the future regarding IPNS, we'll uh, uh, mainly be working on two major things to improve it during 2019. Um, first, as, uh, as Go IPFS currently supports, uh, we will implement a streaming API in uh, JSLine as well. This will occur during, uh, uh, hopefully, this quarter when we migrate the code base to async iterators and uh, uh, I will prioritize uh, IPNS and uh, DHT in my tasks if you decide to go uh, with IPNS. Then uh, uh, after having this uh, short-term goal to improve the IPNS performance, we aim uh, uh, to Q4, Q2. Uh, as we decided during the team week uh, we, about all the DSD issues that we have, and uh, some of them are really critical, at le even in Go for uh, uh, enhancing Falcon before the, la the launch. So uh, during the uh, uh, Q2, uh, uh, during this quarter, we intend to have a plan on how to improve the DHT. And uh, with this plan, we intend to upgrade it during Q2. But uh, we don't uh, have the plan yet, so we don't uh, exactly know how long it will take, but the current plan is to have uh, uh, IPNS over DHT and uh, more performant DHT by the end of Q2. Uh, any questions? Yeah, um, let's say that, uh, let, let's create a scenario. Let's create the best possible scenario um, right now. Like, so let's say that I have a good connection and I'm already connected to a lot of peers and I decide to make a change um, to my APNS entry to point to another, uh, to something else. Uh, 
do you have some kind of benchmarks right now um, in terms of the current state of the implementation? How many seconds that it, does it take? How many seconds does, does it take to change, to actually uh, propagate the change? Uh, we don't currently have benchmarks, but from my experience in uh, testing it, uh, if we have the DHT enabled and uh, we are running uh, the daemon for a while, as it uh, is getting more and more connections, we end up uh, getting, I don't know, maybe at least two, three minutes to publish and to resolve, which I think is a lot for uh, your use cases. So you, you said minutes, correct? You said two to three minutes? Yes, exactly. All right, so that's quite a lot. Um, and, and you know the speed of the, the, the fetch operation, like a read operation? Um, does it take also that amount of time? Yes, but uh, as I, I don't know if you uh, are experienced with the uh, IPNS over but so, uh, but uh, that's, uh, I, I said that's the best way for you to start because in the, in the IPNS, if you enable IPNS over pubs, so basically you will subscribe to the topics that you want and uh, uh, you will receive in real time the, the updates. So you are subscribing uh, the, all the modifications of IPNS record. The first time it will take a lot because it will need to fetch it from the DHT, but afterwards you can fetch whenever you want and it will, you will have a local, cop, a local record of that, that IPNS uh, key in your, uh, in your node. Uh, but yes, you need to have the PubSub enabled for that. But in, and publish will take a lot too, if you need it. So what, what you're saying is that resolving is faster if we already resolved it in the past, but publishing already takes, uh, or takes the same two to three minutes in the best uh, case scenario. Yep, correct. Can I, can um, I add something quickly? Um, uh, on the, I'm not sure exactly how it's implemented on the uh, JavaScript side, but on the Go side, something Vasco and I were talking about was on the Go side, they have uh, a streaming implementation. So the way the IPNS works is it basically goes and tries to fetch, I think something like 16 <clears throat> different copies of uh, a key from throughout the DHT, which is why it takes so long. Um, but the idea of the streaming protocol is that it will return those to you one by one as they come in rather than waiting for all 16 to arrive. So if we do, if we use streaming, then it should be a lot faster. Yes, that, that will be uh, our first uh, approach and uh, we hopefully will have that uh, in, uh, for you for Q1, by the end of Q1, uh, but uh, even uh, using uh, the, uh, there is for, for instance, the, that guy is from Open Bazaar that uh, made the modification of uh, getting only a single DHT record, which is uh, way faster, but uh, also has problems about synchronization. And uh, if you, we end up providing the stream API, there is also to be considered that uh, from your side, you will, you will need to decide which will be the best record. There is the most recent, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good point. It's obviously a trade-off between um, sort of confidence or security. Um, much like when you're when you're putting a new block onto the end of the blockchain, you have to wait a while to to decide how secure you feel that it is. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I would say that um, in terms of the trade-offs between security and, and, and performance, we are more inclined to the to the security side uh, because we are dealing with. Um, you know, the IDs and the ID documents that must be um, in the sense that we can't really lose information or at least make an effort to not lose information. So let's consider a scenario, scenario where um, you have two public keys added to, the, to your DID document. If one, um, if one computer or device updates the, the, um, the IPNS record pointing to a DID document that doesn't have uh, the full previous keys, uh, it will be an issue. So we have to consider that scenario and perhaps there are also other solutions or other extra steps on top of the, um, the streaming API that we can implement in order to make it more secure um, as well as performance. Uh, that's why we are here to, to discuss on, on that. Um, uh, 
can I can I point out something? It's uh, in terms of security itself. I think the 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 uh, IPNS implementation always authenticates the the, the updates. If I'm not wrong, uh, if I'm wrong, Vasco, please correct me. It's yeah. not a, a matter of security itself. It's more a matter of safety in the sense that longer you wait, the longer, the more, uh, the less probability you have of uh, having a stale document out there that you don't, a stale version out there that you don't know about. Is that correct, Vasco? Yes, it's correct. It, you, it is all, always authenticated, but uh, you can end up having an updated record. So we go for 16 of them and check. We have a function that uh, verifies which one is the best and returns only the best. Can I make a question also about the, the inner workings of IPNS? Uh, so there, I, I believe the, the, the record has, a, the IPNS record has a sequence number, right? That is, uh, tend to be, is monotonic uh, it increases one on each update but that's true for the the same device if you do uh, have the same key on two different uh, uh, devices the same IPNS key on two different devices and do a concurrent publish you will end up with um, a desynchronization right yes we currently uh support more or less that type of use case where you can have you, you can share keys because we didn't uh, work uh, and uh, spec it yet because as we do not have uh, from now at least a secure way of exchanging keys between peers we are not uh, at least officially supporting that and uh, there are there can be some misbehaviors and that will be one of them because when we get when we publish a new one we basically check our local data store get the the most recent that we published and uh, basically increment the sequence number. So it will fail into devices. Correct, and that's also in parallel with the work that Dirk has been doing in a, like a long uh, standing pull request on Peerbase, for instance, for multi-writer IPNS emulation, like, right? So there, there's also some, I wouldn't say workarounds, but uh, some, um, um, if if uh, two peers uh, write to the same IPNS uh, key, there could be some way of uh, merging those concurrent changes together. Um, yeah, that that was uh, what I'm gonna suggest. If if it's possible to think about on on a solution that will solve the multi-writer scenario uh, of co including concurrent updates, m much like. The, the things we are dealing with with CRDTs and so on, or DAG, uh, DAG uh, pointers, it will solve the problem um, that we are having. Um, yes, yes I, I, I would say reg regarding that, that we probably could uh, open an issue, I don't know, maybe in the IPNS spec. And uh, from there, we could also discuss with Stevalin because I, I talked with him a while ago about this and the, the conclusion that we had at the moment was that uh, as we didn't have a concrete use case for this, we ended up delaying the thinking about how we would solve that problem. Uh, Peter, do you have any idea on having like um, a side chain for this? Like think about, think about um, APNS as a blockchain in the sense that it is the source of the truth, uh, but it's slow and, and, and so on. Could we have like a side tree um, or a side chain that we could um, more, uh, be more uh, real time in terms of the, the updates and, and there won't be any conflicts. And then we publish um, to the IPNS uh, entry uh, uh, the, the, the result of the merging itself. Um. I think there, there, we have been discussing this since uh, um, since the IPFS uh, IPFS week in, in Glasgow. Um, there's been some back and forth. Um, so I think the consensus was that IPNS wasn't designed itself to be uh, multi-device or multi multi-peer, um, and so yes, yeah, any any. 
uh, solution that we have would have to be on 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 top of that. Uh, Dirk, do you do you remember those those conversations um, on what's the status of the multi? Well, I know you weren't there, but you've been doing some. You have that fresher in in your mind, perhaps. What's yeah, that's true. It was a while ago. Mm -hmm. um, I think that basically the, the solution that you, um, you and I, Pedro, were talking about was uh, it was more like detecting after the fact if there's been a collision, and then right. uh, you know eventually if we use a CRT CRDT type model <clears throat> that it should all uh, converge. Um, but it, yeah, it doesn't feel like a fantastic solution to be honest. Right. So. Um... There was also some some covers. Yeah, so I, I remember a bit now. Uh, you would have a, a leader, and one of the the peers uh, that shares the IPNS key would be responsible at any given time for the updating. So even if you have like a side chain per uh, device, one of the peers would be at either explicitly or implicitly be elected a leader uh, using. Uh, for, in, for instance, leader election or implicit um, uh, leader assignment, and and that leader would be responsible for updating the, the IPNS entry with um, an, the official version. Um, How do you deal with um, split brain scenarios in that in those in this solution? I think Dirk, we have been discuss I think there is an issue that we have been not exactly yeah. discussing. We've been discussing that for uh, persistence, for um, persistence of a CRDT itself. But I think the problem is is the same. Uh, once you have a, a split brain, there are a bunch of scenarios that that will emerge. I think we we described some of those scenarios, Dirk. In yes. So so. We were sort of thinking about it in the context of persistence, as you say, and so we kind of like added a layer on top, which was to have leadership election. Uh, so obviously, if you have a single leader, then that's your uh, your single writer. So that sort of adapts itself to the IPNS scenario with a single writer. Right. Um, but then, yeah, as you say, Andre, there's a problem where if you get a split brain, <clears throat> then two leaders can start overriding each other. <clears throat> so it turns out it's possible to detect when that's happening. Uh, and so if you detect, one of them backs off and eventually you'll get into a consistent state. So that I think was eventually where we landed. All right. So uh, just to further um, give, give importance to this meta, even, even um, I mean, this problem that we are having, like multi-writer scenario, um, is not... Um, only uh, strictly associated with IPNS and uh, sorry to IPAD because uh, we have um, we'll have a discussion about identity profile and if we if we opt for using IPFS to store the identity profile and so on we'll also have these kind of problems like I, I in multiple devices can edit my profile and, and we'll deal with uh, multi-writer scenarios and conflicts and so on so it will make probably makes sense to um, solve these in, in an agnostic way and in, in some low wind or low level library uh, that we could reuse uh, in this in this IPNS uh, IPID method and also for other use cases as you said on your side on, on peer based persistence and also on, on identity profile. Does it make sense? Yes. Um, I, I, can I can I say something? Uh, I, I guess it makes it makes sense to solve it on on lower layers, of course, um, and to do conflict conflict resolution, you could do automated using using uh, could do it automatically using a, a CRDT, um, and then you can expose the the view um, the view of the CRDT as the DID document itself. Um, to the to the upper layer um, i'm wondering whether this mechanism is um, is something that well the, that um, for the first iteration that should we need to have this mechanism this multi-writer um, 
uh, motivator capability or could we um, like default to something like if we detect um, uh, they detect conflicts and then we alert the user or, or, or something because the user will be the same user right it will be the same human correct correct um, yeah in this case it's more focused and, and we can end up with a more a specific solution for those conflicts it's true it won't it won't be user friendly uh, but yes we can make com compromises because if, if, for instance, in a device you detect that two concurrent versions with the same sequence number that have has different data, the different uh, uh, data, then we we could defer to the user to 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 resolve to 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 one of them. Um, well, we could all, always store a CRDT, and 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 it will um, be automatically mergeable. Um, the thing is that we. The DID document itself will not, unless I'm, I'm, I'm wrong about it, the DID document itself being a CRDT, is the, the CRDT is a complex data structure, it's not a, a DID document, so it does not conform to the DID spec. And uh, if, if you store the CRDT data on, on IPNS uh, for later conflict resolution, and so it will not have the, you know, it will, not be presentable for, for instance people that are uh, using IPLD to navigate or if, uh, using the IPLD inspector yeah. for instance they will not be able to inspect uh, the ID document. That, that's not a problem uh, mm -hmm. at, at least uh, what the spec says is that uh, the resolver of the DID method must return a valid DID document mm -hmm. and there's actually many DID methods that use uh, a more kind of operational um, a CRDT, not, not CRDT, but similar. For instance, uh, Uport is exploring with cheaper uh, DID methods based on Ethereum as well, that they use, in, in the sense that they use the events, a capability of, of smart contracts, to reconstruct the whole DID document. So instead of uh, storing the DID document, uh, the whole DID document in each operation, you just store the operation itself. Like, I've added this public key, I've removed this authentication key and so on. And then what they do is they uh, read the, the whole event fired by the smart contracts and reconstruct the DID documents uh, based on those events. Uh, so it will be similar to that sense uh, Our if we end up uh, going by that approach. Okay. Uh, so in terms of the resolver, it will return the, the correct DID document. But the implementation itself, uh, it's not complete. It must be, uh, it must query all the, the DAG nodes and so on. Go ahead, Vasco. You, you want yeah. to speak? Yeah, I, I think that uh, improving, it, when imp the DHT's performance is improved, uh, it seems a reasonable plan for me, to, uh, the one that you described. Well, my question is, how does, uh, how does the resolver find all the pieces yeah, so uh, basically let's, this is like uh, one possible implementation. So uh, basically you will, um, let's say, are, are you seeing the documents on Quickpad? Uh, yes. You have it open, like in the line 30, you have the ID, IP ID, and afterwards you have the IPNS public key. So basically you will query that IPNS key and it will give you uh, not the DID document, but um, a CID or a set of CIDs that uh, point to, to a DAG node uh, that has the last operation and the, that the DAG node itself points to the previous operation and so on. And then you, what you, you basically do is so, uh, resolve all those DAG, uh, DAG nodes based on the, their partial order uh, and then use like a tiebreaker or something like that to, to uh, break the tie. So you end up with a, sh a chain of DAG nodes that are like operations, and you, uh, in the end, you you um, you have a DID document based on those operations. Basically, does it make sense? It does, but um, I think you still have the same problem where you have to figure out how to point to the end of the chain. Yeah, and you yeah, might correct. end up having 
you know, overriding your own end. Uh, yeah, the IPNS uh, multi-write scenario is, is still a problem. Uh, it doesn't solve the problem at all. This is like just the implementation itself. Uh, we need we need still to uh, resolve the multi-writer scenario. Um, so, yeah, we need to like the multi-writer scenario needs to hence the fact that might have we might have multiple heads and we must store them reliably so that we don't lose any ads um, when doing concurrent updates. So uh, to, to summarize if uh, the, the way that this would work would, uh, so if you come up with a concurrent and uh, divergent, sorry, a, a concurrent, uh, two concurrent versions of the same DID document, um, by querying the DHT, you get to do two concurrent versions, uh, and then you, you would merge them. Um, Correct. Right, so we have still, to- Still, still yeah. how can you uh, reliably store the pointers or the heads of the DAG nodes uh, concurrently? That, that's a different problem. Um, so let's say that I, I'm off, offline or partially offline and in another device I'll, I'm, I'm fully online and I make a change like I approve a device on both devices, another device, both will uh, point to a new head and we must write to that to the um, IPNS entry, right? How can we deal with that? Yeah, that's so the, the issue. Currently IPNS is one writer wins, okay? Or, 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 or is random. Uh, so what, what happens with, I don't know about the inner workings of IPNS, but how does an inner node handle storing to concurrent versions? Um, so it, it, for instance, there is version five, and then it gets an update from someone that, oh, this is actually, this is the, 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 the version five, and we have, now we have that to concurrent, so it will not update, right? Yes, basically, uh, you uh, the the entity that publishes uh, IPNS record, uh, it also st it, uh, it besides uh, sending it to the network, it stores it in the in the, the local data store as well. And basically, uh, there is two different keys: one which is supposed to be kept uh, locally, and another one which is used for the routing, in in order to uh, understand every time what supposedly was the last published one, but only locally. So if we, when uh, we look for the key in the network, the, the key will be different from the local one, and uh, the peer has, has, hasn't a notion of if that record has been uh, published by another peer or not. Oh, okay. I think maybe the only solution here is for us to have a different kind of operation. So let's imagine it's a DHT. So in the DHT, we have a write and a read operation. And what we really need is a merge operation. Right. Um. But, but the, mer the merge operation would not write in the local uh, data store of the peer that previously published the data? Well, what I'm imagining is that it would, uh, it would merge in any new changes. In that way, you could keep track of concurrent heads and then you could resolve them. So the problem now is that you can't, um, you're always overwriting what's there instead of looking at what's there and merging something into it so you can keep track of concurrent heads. Does that make sense? Um, I'm uh, the, I'm not sure because uh, the DHT itself does not have uh, uh, idea of the the keys that are used in the IPNS because the the DHT just receives puts and uh, gets and mer and uh, eventually merges, but uh, the it uh, received previously imagine a put from uh, the IPNS module and the, the IPNS module also made a put to the local data store which uh, is like in a different place from the DHT. But, but how the, does the DHT handle uh, stale updates, for instance, to make, making sure that a node that has been offline for some time does not try to overwrite an entry? Um, okay, basically, uh, 
when uh, when you query the the DHT, it gets those uh, sixteen records uh, across the network, and it it has that function which selects uh, which one of the sixteen records are the best is the best one, and from there, if uh, uh, are they are if they are different, it's it's okay. This one is the best. I will broadcast now this to the remaining peers that told me that they had a record, but it is outdated, and all of them update to the new one. All right, one question. If, mm -hmm. if there's no 60 peer, peers, uh, does the operation fail? Uh, I think so, I'm not sure. All right, so that basically gives us some guarantee um, in the sense that if, if the new peer is really behind and tries to update the, the record and the new record, uh, there's a new record actually, that new record will be published instead, right? So, so after the operation, the, the peer can query again in terms of fetching the record. And if it's different from what he published, it means that uh, he, he was um, out of date and, uh, and his operation was kind of denied. Correct. Uh, I'm not sure if I understand your question. I can I can rephrase. So let's say that we have A and B uh, peers that have the same IPNS. I want to play the same IPNS uh, entry. All right. So let's say that the first peer is very old and and it's very behind uh, in terms of the the um, the whole network and is offline right now. All right. And the new peer, the new peer, the second peer publishes a new record. Um, and after some time, uh, like the, let's say one month, uh, the first peer gets back online and immediately tries to publish uh, a new record. All right. Does the new record uh, goes through, uh, or does it get denied because the second peer uh, has actually published something before um, that it is in, that the first peer didn't know about? It goes through. It goes through. All right. Yeah. So that, that kind of sucks. <laughs> um, I think in the Go implementation, if I remember correctly, they actually fetch the sequence number before writing to the network. Uh, I'm, right. I, I think we don't do that in JavaScript, but uh, I can check. Yeah, the Sorry. problem with that is that it's very slow. Yeah. So, so you, what you're saying is that the Go implementation actually fetches the, the that monotonic incrementation number or increment number, and if, it's, so. if it mits, mismatches, it it basically fails, right? Well, it'll it'll increment it, so it'll it'll go and get oh, the latest copy right. of the data, including the sequence number, then it'll override an increment. And you know, if if that's that's something that is visible from the the consumers of the the Go uh, LibTP, because if, no, if we know the, that the increment, the incrementation, the incrementation um, was not monotonic, like I said, it was two to three times, then we might assume, okay, this, is what, this was a concurrent update, so I must do something else. I need to fetch the previous versions and do a merge. Like if that was visible, we could do something like that. Um, I, I, I've been wondering if we could use something like Peerbase um, to solve the CRDT part, um, and then uh, we, we publish the what we publish to the to the PNS records would be would be the, the the result of the CRDT value. Uh, I don't know if that looks reasonable for for to solve this solution. Yeah, no, that's kind of what I was. Problem. That's that's kind of what I was trying to get to uh, with the persistence protocol. Um, so that was that was certainly on my mind as well. I think uh, um, probably Adin has some has some clearer ideas of of where he would like to go with this as well. All right, um, all right. So uh, basically, the outcome of this was that um, Vasco hopes to have. Uh, significant improvements on the performance of, of IPID and FIPNS, sorry, and also uh, we might, we need to come up with a, with a solution for the multi-writer scenario. There, there have been a few uh, uh, candidates for this. 
I think we need to, you know, think about think about um, uh, asynchronously and and also um, maybe maybe comment on the on the issue uh, a few proposals to solve this because we need to. There's also, there's also another problems that we need to tackle on this discussion, and we have like 50 minutes, and I would like to to address another concern that I have. So uh, we have another problem of IP ID, which is basically because your DID um, uh, is composed by the hash of your public key. Uh, it means that if your private key uh, is compromised, the, the one that you use to update the record gets compromised somehow, essentially your DID, is, the whole identity is compromised. You can't really recover it because uh, the DID itself uh, contains the, the private key. So you can't Sorry, the public key. So it means that you can can simply issue another one because the RDID will be different. Um, is does it make sense to anyone? So that we are in the same page. Yes. All right. Um, so I've been thinking about a few solutions uh, to this problem. Um, we have the first solution that that I've listed here. Um, it's not really a solution. <laughs> it's more like a. Um, something that we force to, to users. So basically, because this is an issue, it means that the IPNS uh, private key, um, the, the private key that you use to play the IPNS record needs to be kept safe and away from the devices. So essentially, uh, on the first time that you use the IDM, we construct the, the, the private key. And this is another question, uh, Vasco, can we construct the IPNS private key uh, ourselves, or is, is it something that uh, is built in and we don't really have an uh, option to create it? Uh, yes, basically, if you if you start the at least in the CLI, I think the HTTP it should be the same. Uh, if you start the daemon uh, with a new key, if, for instance, you use the IPFS key generate and generate your own key, and afterwards you start the daemon and you map the, the, the key that you want to use is that key instead of the key from the peer itself, right. then you can use it. All right, uh, because uh, my solution was to use Shamu secret sharding. So basically we have 12 words that uh, we can use to reconstruct the private key. So basically the devices wouldn't have the, the, the IPNS private key um, um, almost never. Uh, and, and once it's needed, because it's needed to update the DID document, we ask for a few of those words in order to reconstruct the private key temporarily, uh, issue an update on the DID, on the on the record, on IPNS record, and, and delete it afterwards. So it's something like temporary. Uh, imagine like in terms of the user interface, you are guided to throughout the creation of your identity, and in the final step, it will be something like, okay, uh, you have to store these words in order to recover your identity. Uh, please make sure that you, you have those words re written somewhere and, and safely stored, because you will be, they will be deleted. And once the user uh, clicks next, it will be prompted again to confirm, and then we delete it. So this is basically the solution, the solution number one. So uh, th does it make sense, or is there any doubt in this, in this regard? I guess it te technically makes sense. It's not very friendly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So the issue is whenever you need to add a new device uh, or revoke a device, you need to prompt uh, for the, 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 the percentage, a certain percentage of, of those 12 words, which is not very user friendly, right? There's something to consider, which is um, the, 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 um, the amount of times that you will add a new, a new device and remove a new device, uh, remove a device, is not that frequent, uh, but it's still not user-friendly. So I've been thinking about another solution, and this is solution number two, uh, which is a layered key solution. So let me try to explain, and, and bear in mind that uh, it might take some time to try to understand that, but I will try to explain. So essentially, it's similar to the solution one, in the sense that, we have an, an, a private key that controls the, the record, the IPNS record, but that IPNS record doesn't point to the heads or to the DAD document uh, itself. It points to another um, IPNS record. 
right? And that, uh, that second record is controlled by a layer two IPNS private key. Um, and that uh, second IPNS record actually points to the heads or to, do, to the DID document. What this gives us is that we can have the second layer key shared among devices so that we can easily add a new device um, uh, to, that, to that list because we are in the control of the DID document itself. Um, but whenever we need to revoke a new device, we need to uh, basically generate a new layer to IPNS key, disseminate it to, to all the devices except the ones that, except the one that we are kicking out. And, uh, and lastly, we apply the layer one key pointing to the, to the second, to the new second layer two key. So in terms of user friendly, it's very easy to add new devices. Imagine like even, even the add new device could be like simply pairing with a QR code because we can leverage uh, um, IPFS and PubSub and so on to imagine uh, you are creating a new device uh, or in, uh, set up, set, setting up IDM on a new device and you ha already have IDM on another device. Um, you can select from which device you want to import or set up and you click on that device and you just simply uh, need to scan that QR code and the second layer key will be encrypted and passed to the new device. So it will, it will be shared among devices. And that, does it make sense? Because it's something quite complex. Does anyone have any doubt or? or? Oh, yeah, I, think, I think I understood it, uh, yeah. All right. Um, so in, in, in the key point is that it's more secure in the sense that you don't need, need the, the layer one key there often. You just need one revoking a device. Um, and we still have, and it's more user friendly because you, you, can, you can scan QR codes. You can al always ask for the, the 12 uh, words for, for, from the layer two key, um, which is you know, good for the user experience when pairing a new device. But when you are revoking a device, you need to uh, prompt for um, those 12 words, or at least a percentage of those 12 words. Um, so this is another solution. What do you think about, about it in general? Uh, I have to think about, about, <laughs> about that uh, some more time, perhaps offline. Um, yeah, sure. Um, right. Yes. Um, um, yeah. Multi multi layer keys. I I I think. Uh, but when you 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 only store only the second layer when you want to revoke. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So so the basic the the thing is that the layer one key is not stored uh, on the devices. It's actually stored. Temporarily until you back it, back it up. Like imagine in, in IBM will have like a, a warning saying, hey, you need to back up your, these, these 12 words or, or something like that. When once it's done, the, um, the layer one key is completely deleted. It's, it's just stored by you or you can even disseminate the words to your friend and so on. Um, and then the, the layer two key is actually what it's stored on the devices um, in order to easily add new devices. Um, that's basically it um, oh. as well. Also, also the, the concept of master key and, and device key and session key is still the same. Basically, the master key is composed by a two layer key, all right? The device key still exists in the concept of the IDM and so on. Uh, it's not uh, mixed with what we are discussing here. We are discussing the master key and the master key is a two layer approach key, basically. Okay, okay, makes sense. So, um, so when you are resolving <coughs> the key, you need to do two IPNS lookups, right? Correct. <laughs> That's <laughs> why I asked about the performance of you know, fetching operations because it might influence the, the solution. So if it takes like four minutes to read uh, a record from, from a, um, a node that hasn't and did any, any lookup yet, it's basically, it, it basically uh, makes me decide, okay, we're not going to do this at all. Well, it may not be so bad, though, because as you say, you're not going to change the, um, 
the layer one queue very often. And, yeah. you know, there's, as Fasco was saying, you can use PubSub to kind of, like once you've fetched it once, then you can kind of just keep an eye on it and it'll update yeah. pretty much in real time. Yeah. Um, and then we have a solution tree, which honestly, I, I didn't quite understand um, the solution there. Uh, it was proposed by uh, Adin. Uh, but, but I mean, I read it like a few times already and, and I couldn't really understand uh, what, it, what it, mean, it means with a custom validator and so on. So perhaps if you could help me out understand what, what, he try, what he's trying to express there, it will be awesome. So I think what he's saying is that um, there's like a way that you can kind of flag that a uh, that something has been invalidated. So if you you check this key and if there's a value at the key, that means that what you thought was valid is no longer valid. I think that's what it's saying. All right, but but how does it solve the the compromise uh, key in terms of like my private key they used to update records was compromised. Um, how, how does it solve that? Because the, the, the hash of the public key is your DID. So uh, we, you can't really, you know. I think this is also a kind of two layer key scenario where this is only the layer two key that's been compromised. Yeah, I also thought about that. Perhaps what he's trying to say is something like, by, by a custom validator is, it maybe points to a two layer key or something like that to validate uh, those scenarios. But it's not, uh, I mean, it's not very clear. Um, anyway, we are doing the recording and perhaps Adin could um, clarify a bit on, on what he tried to explain there uh, later, later on. Um, so in terms of the, the whole topic was to, um, decide on the first ID method. And uh, we already discussed on a few problems of IP ID. Uh, and, and there's also another possibility, which is you port and block stack. Uh, I will not go for block stack because um, while they are, well, while they are techn technically using uh, DID methods, um, or sorry, they are techn technically a DID method, they don't really um, comp uh, uh, big, they are, aren't really compliant with the spec right now. And secondly, when I tried it, um, they didn't expose the DID documents itself. So, so essentially the libraries that they supply don't re really give us uh, control over the DID document. Um, on the contrary, Uport has a core library that um, basically they use in their mobile app and, and other scenarios. So essentially you have all the tools to create um, your port identities and manipulate them as, as we see fit. Um, so we still we still have been facing those those two scenarios like your port or IPID. Um, do, we, do you have like a strong opinion on on if you should go to through throughout IPID or your port solution as the first ID method or or not? Well, I guess I guess uh, um, you have some experience with Uport. Um, that's a pro for for using uh, Uport. I guess IPID is not very complex unless you start delving into the multi-device uh, problem. Um, so, if you want to attack multi-device problem from the get-go, I guess Uport is more uh, prepared for that. 
um, uh, otherwise I, I would if you you don't want to start with the multi device I would start with with IPID because it's fairly simple it is good to exercise um, to be good to exercise IPNS uh, itself but if well I guess it would be hard to change uh, the plain IPID into using a multi-layered uh, key approach um, so there is also a, a cost of migrating into a, um, some sort of multi-layered key or, or um, uh, approach um, I'm not maybe, sure maybe it depends a bit on the use case right because um like for example bitcoin you know if you lose your key you just lost you know a million dollars or in my case ten dollars uh, but people sort of have learned to accept that for that particular use case so maybe it's okay to develop that as as a starting point if it's simple just just for that particular use case where there's no key revocation or anything and then to create more complex kinds of identity further down the line i agree if, if, we, if we could if, if we could layer Identities like 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 you have the device identity, uh, and I, I know that that you've been thinking a lot about this. So device keys and then session keys, and then a master key on top of those. Um, but if you could layer, uh, in terms of the the software architecture, uh, you could layer like the there is device keys and that has its own API PNS. If you lose it, your the device is compromised. Uh, and later, if you want to like have a master identity that brings those together uh, perhaps it could be added later um. yeah I, i've been thinking about um this uh, in terms of the solution one versus the solution two um by doing the solution one uh, we aren't really saying that we are going to have solution two in the future because those are, are evolving specs and we can have versioning of the specs. So essentially, uh, the, um, the spec of the IP, IP ID can evolve, and the software, the code itself, can, can and may and should handle different versions. Let's say that I'm resolving this IP ID, um, this ID pointing to a IP ID record, IPNS record, I should be able to see the version, and by looking at the version, I, sh I, I can fork can have forks in terms of code to handle those different scenarios. So we could start for uh, by having the solution one, which is really simple. It doesn't have many many of, of the, the issues we are discussing. Mm -hmm. uh, but bear in mind that the solution one has some implications in terms of the Y and UX, because having a new, a new device is really cumbersome. Um, it's not, not really straightforward in terms of the user experience. You have to type words and, and stuff like that. Uh, even, even to... No, what, what I was saying is that... Is that um, uh, yeah, I understand. Uh, but a new device would be a new, a new key, a new identity. I know that's not, not uh, great, but if the... And, uh, and I think we would have to think about this a bit, but if you could layer... Uh, make it so that uh, it doesn't compromise future uh, multi multi -devi device solutions. Like first, you only have a device key, and later, you, you, so first you have uh, Andrea at uh, iPhone X, and later you can have Andre uh, that has multiple devices. Um, because the, the multi the multi device problem or revoking a device uh, or is uh, like a, a complex uh, very complex issue I would say as we um, yeah I mean it, it's not that uh, complex is that it's just that the specs um, for the revocation list or the public keys that were revoked are um, kind of flexible because they don't really specify the data structure for that. Uh, but essentially, in terms of the technical side, what you really have to do is, um, and taking taking um, or assuming that we already have a solution for the multi-writer scenario, what we really have to do is take the IPNS record, um, update uh, to a version of the document that doesn't contain the public key um, that was compromised, mm -hmm. um, and 
and also make it available throughout the revocation list. So essentially, if I query, query the revocation list, it will be it'll also be added. That key will be added to that to that list, and all the signatures made prior to that moment are valid, and all the signatures uh, made afterwards will be invalid or discarded, and also all all, all the DID out that happens with a key that was revoked will be uh, will fail basically. Um, so it's not really complex. It's just that the multi-writer scenario and also the master key is necessary for this operation. Okay, understood. Basically, whenever you need to mutate the document, you need the, you need the master key. That that's the thing. Um, but with some clever tricks like the the layer two. Um, or the two layers approach uh, for the master key. The master key can be disseminated to the, throughout the devices because you really have a last resort uh, private key to revoke all the others, basically, mm -hmm. and to get back control of the identity. And, and yeah, one thing that, that might, might help is that what resides in, in this public profile, uh, because if it's just the cryptographic material, uh, the public keys, yeah. Uh, it's just a material. For for uh, we don't need to update that often. It's just when adding a new, a new device um, or removing a, a, a device, right? And right. so it's all the rest is stored uh, separately, uh, right. and it's like self, self sovereign. Everyone has has um, control over which parties receive those. Um, the, the, the receives those certificates, so... Um, yeah, the credentials. The, the that's the credentials I'm going to have on Friday. But yes, this is like a separate thing. Mm -hmm. the, of course, it's related, but it, it can be thought out separately. At, uh, at, at, I'm, I'm just like, thinking how often, how often you, would, you would have to update those, those documents. And uh, it's just whenever you add a new device or revoke a new device. Um, and maybe if we let her have <laughs> Uh, let's say uh, uh, cafe alike or identity hub alike service that you want to associate to your identity. You may also need your master key so that your um, DID document has a property called services that points um, that has an entry there pointing to your cafe alike or identity okay. hub alike instance. All right. Um, so when you want to add one, okay. Yeah, add, add or revoke or uh, as well. Basically, whenever you need to mutate the DID, DID document, you need your um, you need the master key of your DID document. Right. Uh, hmm. Which I'll, is, I'll, you know, it's not very often, really. It's not very often. I mean, I, you I would you, say that that it's not it's not too bad to have a paper key. Uh, exactly, a paper key. Yeah. For solution one, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, you can we can do that as the first version. So that we don't really get locked in in a, a complex solution and so on. And later on, when we have everything working, I mean, um, the IDs and verifiable credentials and, and identity profiles and um, the IDM itself, uh, we might think uh, on on improving to to have like a version two with the two layer approach or something similar. We can we can do that. Uh, but but I mean the uh, the multi writer is still a problem uh, on both scenarios because because your your key will be uh, needed to update uh, the the DID document but there might be some conflicts conflicts if you um, you know have concurrent updates for instance whenever you use uh, uh, ADM offline to change something or to approve a device something like that and 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 then. You also approve a device on another device, and then you have a concurrent update, and that's a problem. Correct. Um, yeah, I, th I think solution solution one is, is not too bad. The multi multi writer, uh, I guess, si since the spec doesn't require you to store the pl the plain text of the JD document, if you could store it as a CRDT that can later be merged at the edges, um, I think that problem can be. Uh, mitigated um, because what you would end up is like if a device is offline some changes are made when it comes offline some concurrent changes can be happening but he will detect that it will merge it will create a new entry yeah. and the cycle repeats again 
until right. until we get we get a uh, eventually get get a um, into consistent a, a consist, uh, into consistent state. So uh, I, I guess that that would be yeah okay uh, yeah it probably will be the solution that we will, will uh, use and also we can leverage um, a simpler solution to the connectivity thing status thing because whenever you you update your uh, approval device something like that and you are offline. Mm -hmm. uh, we can leverage some uh, UI language saying, hey, you didn't synchronize your um, this device somehow, you need to be online for it to, to synchronize. Something, I think, some, it, I think it could be useful for, for instance, when you're adding a device for, for when you have multiple devices uh, that you have some information on pairing um, or synchronization status of, of yeah. the, the replication. We'll need that for the identity profile. That's something that we'll be discussing on Friday, but essentially uh, all the identity profile, your name, your photo, and uh, all the information, the personal information that you have, including your social proofs, mm -hmm. uh, will, be, uh, have to, will have to be synchronized and replicated. So whenever you set up a new device and you type like the six of the 12 words and you, you know, have a, a new device working on, you need to replicate that stuff. And that, that is a process that we must, um, mm, right. this must be intuitive for the user and so on. Okay, okay. Um, all right. Sorry guys, I, I, have, I have to run. Um, yeah, yeah, all right, me too. So outcome of this, um, this meeting, first we need to uh, probably discuss using CRDT, oh sorry, probably we're gonna use CRDT to solve the multi-writer multi scenario. Uh, I will uh, discuss if we need, or if we're gonna use peer base or similar to that. Uh, and also uh, the CRDT itself, um, like the merging resolution is what was really gonna be uh, stored on the, on the um, deck nodes, either the full document or just the ads. Um, and then we have a resolving part. And for, in terms of the, um, the, the solutions one, two, or three, we're gonna stick with the first one for now, which is the paper key. And later on, we will uh, evolve the spec in order to uh, be more secure and user friendly. Correct? Correct. I, I added those, those notes as, as uh, takeaways. Um, All right. That is enough for me because I, I now can focus on um, the solution one. Uh, both in terms of code and also user experience. Awesome. And for the multi-writer scenario, I will um, think about uh, how can you use the CRDTs and also how the state will be stored on the deck nodes, if it's a full JSON uh, or, or if it's just the operations. And then I will come up with, with something on, on GitHub and we'll um, discuss this uh, asynchronously, basically. Yeah, correctly. Uh, cor uh, so correct. Uh, the, the, the CRDT, just a quick note for the CRDT. If you want to keep track of who did what, at which time, for instance, mm -hmm. you, you'll probably end up with the yeah. operation-based yeah. scenario. If you just want to merge state, you'll probably end up with a state-based uh, CRDT. Yeah. Um, I think uh, using the so peer-based things, unless you want to provide a, a, a network replication layer. Uh, yeah, we'll need that. Okay. <laughs> we'll need that for for that, that scenario, for this scenario, because you know, whenever you add a device, you need to store the list of devices somewhere, because whenever you go to another device and the peer base um, boots up and synchronizes, you mm -hmm. will see the same two devices uh, listed listed there in both devices, basically. Right, right. Uh, right and right. you never add anyone; all the devices will see that new device. It should feel real time and, and it should have a replication protocol. And this is the same for the identity profile. Whenever you edit something, like your name and so on, it should be um, replicated among all the devices. And there's encryption going on and some, some uh, things that we also need to discuss on Friday related to uh, the security of this. All right, um, awesome. But I mean, it was good because I already have some decisions um, on this, and also perhaps Pedro, if we go to the if we if we pursue um, the operation based uh, DAC um, to you know resolve to the full document, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps it might might make sense to take Versi DAC and um, extract the 
the writing of the diagnosis and resolve part into, more, into an abstract uh, module. Mm -hmm. So that I can use that here, and also versus that I can use that for the specific case of solving versions. Makes sense. Yeah, makes sense. It, which is really easy task. It's really easy. Um, right. Um, the yeah, beware of of, of the uh, the sync time. The amount of well, if you need operations separate uh, IPLD entries for each one of the operations, or if you just want to have like a big, one big up. I peel the entry that keeps mm -hmm. changing that contains the entire state. Yeah. Um, okay. And and by the way, uh, alternate, alternatively, we you may use we may use um, RBTB. There's a uh, that's another solution. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Instead of using peer base, exactly. uh, we just need to uh, discuss on that. I will uh, comment on on GitHub about this, and, and perhaps we can converge on that, the specific CRDT um, and and replication protocol. Uh, solution specific specific solution either peer base or RBTB or something else. Awesome. All right. Thank you very much for coming and um, see you soon. See you soon. Uh, about the video, uh, want me to publish? Yeah, the... please, uh, please. Yeah, if you could publish it and update the the notes with the link, mm -hmm. uh, the link there on the top, if it will be awesome for right. adding and other people to to watch the video. Will do. All right. Thank you. Bye, guys.